I, uh, I did my undergraduate at the University of Wyoming, and I studied microbiology and molecular biology. That seems like ages ago. Um, and then I did uh, medical school at the University of Washington in Seattle, and then uh, my residency in internal medicine at Providence St. Vincent Hospital in Portland, Oregon. Um, and now I'm a hospitalist at uh, West Park here. Um, and additionally, I'm the head of our antibiotic stewardship program, or the physician lead on our antibiotic stewardship program. And so basically, um, one of the, the roles I fulfill in, in that is that I try to help doctors in the hospital prescribe antibiotics appropriately. Um, and um, I try to educate our medical staff uh, about appropriate use of antibiotics as guidelines change. And then I do things like this where I, I reach out to the community and try to, to share some knowledge in terms of antibiotics so that you guys can make good decisions about your health and how you choose to use antibiotics along with your doctors. Um, so <clears throat> I think we'll, we'll probably have between 20 and 30 minutes of slides. Um, and then I can tell this is a group that is going to have a lot of really good questions and we're going to have a really good discussion about antibiotics because I know a lot of you guys um, are hearing things about um, uh, issues in agriculture related to agri uh, antibiotics. And I, I'm really going to focus on the healthcare side of things right now. Um, I'm happy to, to discuss some of the agriculture related things kind of in, in our discussion section, but I, I'm, I'm going to just brush on, on those things in my presentation. And what I want you guys um, uh, to, to keep in mind is the principles that I'm teaching you about how antibiotic resistance occurs they're going to apply to both humans and animals, okay? So even though I'm not specifically talking about agriculture-related antibiotic practices in this presentation, you can generalize some of these concepts because they're general microbiology concepts about bacteria and microorganisms to agricultural issues, okay? And, and maybe that can open up a discussion after, after the presentation. So my goals in this presentation, I'd like to talk about what the term superbug means. We, we hear it in the media. Uh, we hear it on the internet, we see news articles and different things, but what does it actually mean? What's a good definition for a superbug? Because it sounds really scary, but it's a really vague term when you get down to it. I want to talk a little bit about what life was like before antibiotics. Um, we take them for granted now, and I, and I think it's really important to turn back the clock a little bit and think about what antibiotics, uh, uh, what life was like before they existed or, or were discovered. Um, I want to drastically oversimplify the field of microbiology for you. So if there are any microbiologists in the crowd, I want to apologize in advance because I'm going to butcher microbiology. I'm going to take what it took me four years at the university to learn and I'm going to condense it down into two or three slides. And it's, it's not going to be perfect for, for those of you guys who are really into detail, but the general concepts should hold true and, sh and should be informative. Uh, and last, I'd like to help you guys understand what are some things you can do in terms of your own personal health uh, and in terms of your own antibiotic use that can keep you safe and that can reduce the risk in our society of having organisms that are considered superbugs. So what do you think of when you think of a superbug? You know, when I popped on Google, this is kind of what came up for a superbug. But I, don't, I didn't feel like that was what I was looking for, so I kept going. You might... Think of things like this, uh, a newspaper in California that talked about antibiotic resistant genes being found in parks. You know, so people read this and probably didn't take their kids to the park for a week because they, they thought about all those dangerous bugs that their kids were going to be exposed to on the slide. Or maybe you think about videos on the evening news where, where people are talking about, you know, untreatable infections uh, that are on the rise. Um, but really, <clears throat> In spite of the scary headlines and, and all this talk about death from infection and failing treatments, there's one important thing to recognize is there's a bit of sensationalism in all this, right? You know, it, it's clickbait. It's the kind of stuff that they put out on the internet and they put in the news and they put in the newspaper because it gets people to pay attention, which is why you were all here at my lecture, so thank you. <laughs> but it, it's important to remember what superbugs are really. And, and I think it was really hard for me to find a definition, so I just want to jump into something that the CDC put together. The CDC put together a list of 18 bugs that they consider kind of their top offenders. America's most wanted, if you will, or most unwanted. Um, and I think that list helps us understand what superbugs are. So bear with me for just a little bit and excuse my sense of humor on this. Uh, so they break down these three categories among the 18 bugs, urgent threats, 
serious threats and concerning threats. And then, um, for whatever reason, um, they have this scale that they're using here. And I thought to myself, looking at that, I was like, you know, why is it the federal government always uses the most lame and unimaginative graphics in their stuff? Like, it's like they on purpose try to make science boring so that no one will consider going into it. And I thought, you know, if we're going to encourage our young people to go into science, we have got to do a lot better than this. I thought, you know, maybe we could come up with a cool graphic instead of these lame little circle things that I don't even know what that is. I thought, what if we went with something cool, you know? What if and I thought, no, that's not right, because we're not really busting ghosts, but what if we could do something like that? And so I came up with my own scale because, you know, I noticed, first of all, there are three categories, and yet they're using five things. I thought, well, we don't need five things. So I came up with my own scale. So I'm helping the CDC out. If any one of you would like to forward my recommendations to them, please feel free to do so. And basically, we have the urgent bugs, the serious bugs, and the concerning bugs. So let's look at this list of urgent bugs. We have, these are our top three folks that the CDC is worried about. They're worried about Clostridium difficile infection, which is a bacterium. Uh, they're worried about carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, say that 10 times fast, and Neisseria gonorrhea. So actually, something that used to be pretty easily treated as a sexually transmitted disease is having more and more drug resistance. And it's a big concern because of the number of infections. Not many people die of this, though they might die of shame from having it. Um, but, but it's a serious infection, and it's getting harder and harder to treat. Let's look at the next category and pay attention to this and see if you can get a hint about what a superbug is. Multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter, drug resistant Campylobacter, fluconogal resistant Candida. You start to see a pattern here, right? Resistant, resistant, resistant. Okay, so we're just seeing that the definition of superbugs, according to the CDC, Vancomycin resistant, erythromycin resistant. So you've got an antibiotic, you've got resistance, and then you've got a bug. So what are we talking about? Well, what is a superbug? A superbug is a resistant microorganism or an organism that's resistant to treatment, right? So why are we more worried about these bugs than others? Well, these are bugs that cause infections in humans, okay, and they're hard to treat. So, for example, MRSA or MRSA. Has everyone ever heard of MRSA? Okay, MRSA's, MRSA's probably the infection that we hear the most about in terms of resistant organisms, okay? But all MRSA stands for is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So Staph aureus is just a type of bug that causes skin infections, but it's methicillin-resistant. Now, we don't treat anyone with methicillin. It's just a marker for antibiotic resistance, um, and it really represents that it's not going to respond uh, even to extended-spectrum penicillin-type drugs. And so we've got to use drugs like vancomycin to treat it. So basically, it's just Staph aureus. It's the same bug. It's just drug resistant. Okay. So if you get a staph infection, well, that, that's just different from MRSA because of drug resistance. And that's really the pattern that I want you guys to understand with superbugs. If we distill it down to what a superbug is, a superbug is just a bug. It's just a bacteria, uh, perhaps a, a yeast that's resistant to our common things that we would normally use to treat it. Okay. Now, so if superbugs are just regular bugs with resistance to drugs, why do we care about them? Why are they so scary? Let me share a case that the CDC has on their website. So James is a 60-year-old movie executive, and he began having pain in the right upper part of his abdomen after meals. That's not actually James, that's Michael Bay, for any of you who are interested in that. But he was a handsome dude, and he's a, a movie producer, so I, I, I stole this photo. <laughs> So they did an ultrasound of his belly, and they found some gallstones. So this is a pretty common sort of a thing, right? You know, you have some gallstones, and it's no big deal. So looking at this graphic, what this shows is uh, what they did to, to him, because he didn't just have gallstones in his gallbladder. He actually had had some stones form in his, form in his common bile duct. So basically, you've got your liver that makes the bile. You've got the common bile duct down below the liver, and that's where the bile goes out. The gallbladder comes off that, the pancreas comes off that, and it all dumps down into your small bowel. And so if you get a stone stuck in that duct, they got to go in and get it out. So what they did is they stuck a scope down his throat, they went through the stomach, into the small bowel, and then this is the outlet where that gallbladder, uh, pancreas would be over here, um, and the bile duct comes down. They stick something down there, and they cut open the sphincter at the end, and they kind of get those stones out and, and, and help you feel better. And this is a picture of uh, a fluoroscopy 
of that same thing. You can see the scope coming down with the contrast. You can see the common bile duct filling up. You can see the gallbladder filling up. And that's called an ERCP. So because of concern that one of those stones was blocking his bile duct, he underwent an ERCP. And two days after the procedure, he started having fevers, chills, lightheadedness. And he was one sick puppy by the time he hit the ER. So his heart rate was 140. Blood pressure was 80 over 60. For those of you who are not familiar with blood pressure numbers, that's low. Um, and he was pale and sweaty. And often when we see patients like this, we see confusion. Uh, we see that their kidney function might be elevated. We see that their liver function might be elevated. Um, this is bad. What this is called is this is called septic shock or an infection that's so severe that it's dropping your blood pressure and it's become a life-threatening infection. So what did they do for him? Well, they did appropriate things. They took a sample of his blood. We always get blood cultures to see what bugs are growing in the blood. They gave him IV fluids to help bring that blood pressure up. They probably also gave him medicines to raise the blood pressure. And they gave him broad spectrum antibiotics. So when we treat someone in a life-threatening situation, we throw everything at them, right? We'll cover everything, um, or almost everything. Um, and, and, and we do that because we don't have time uh, to figure out, you know, to wait two days or to wait a day to see what bugs grow in their blood. You've got to get it right right now, because if you don't, they're dead. Um, and what happened? Well, in spite of being admitted to the ICU, he continued to, to do poorly, and he passed away that evening. <clears throat> and the next day, uh, his blood cultures showed this bug called CRE. And it, just like MRSA, um, uh, the CRE is just carbapenem resistant intrabacteriaceae. Um, and the trouble is, is carbapenems are a group of antibiotics that are extremely broad and that can be used in people with septic shock and that normally would be very effective, but in this case weren't. And as they went and they looked at this case, there was something that came up. They realized that there was a cluster of these types of infections. They realized that at this prominent hospital in Los Angeles, there were a group of people who had all had these scopes done and were all having infections with CRE. Um, and they realized that, that probably, even though they were doing their best to clean these scopes, they had scoped someone who was infected with one of these resistant bugs, and then the cleaning practices weren't good enough to get the scope clean, and, um, and they were transmitting this bacteria. Now you should all know, I don't want to scare anyone out of your colonoscopy or your endoscopy. Yeah. <laughs> you should all know that these scopes that you do an ERCP with are different than the scopes that you're getting your colonoscopy with and that you're getting your endoscopy with, okay? So I don't want everyone to call Dr. Welch and Dr. Edder and cancel their appointments for their colonoscopy. Nor have we had any cases of CRE in our community that I'm aware of. But I think it's important to recognize that when people get really bad infections, Antibiotics are that thing that's staying between us and death. And that's something we see relatively frequently uh, is people come in in this type of shape. And the good news is that most of the time with fluids and medicine antibiotics, we're able to turn them around the majority of the time. Now people still die of infections, but, it, but it's much rarer um, than it used to be. And that's what I want to get into next is some history. So let's talk a little bit about some statistics. So, you may look at these statistics and you may say, well, this just isn't very believable, Dr. Weaver. Where did you get this nonsense? Well, I got this. This was put together in uh, 2014. It's from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So when the President of the United States has a question about technology or healthcare, he draws on experts, right? And these are people that are not affiliated with the federal government. These are private people at universities and research institutions, as well as private organizations who have expertise in their field. Well, this is, this is in the document from 2014 where they're talking about the problem with antibiotic resistance. These are the statistics that they give the president, okay? So nine in a thousand women died in childbirth and 40% of those died from septic shock before the advent of antibiotics because infection was so common around the time of childbirth. In some cities, up to 30% of children died before their first birthday. I mean, that's, that's just, I mean, it's hard to believe that it would be totally unacceptable nowadays, right? One in nine people who had a skin infection, we're talking about, you know, you get a, a bite from a bug or you get a scratch and then it turns into a little cellulitis. I knock that down in two days now, now with antibiotics. And one in nine people would die from that infection. And 30% of people who got a pneumonia uh, would die from the bacterial pneumonia. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's, it's almost unbelievable 
to hear statistics like that. 70% of people who got a meningitis would die. Ear infections could cause deafness, deafness, and sore throats could lead to rheumatic fever and heart failure. <clears throat> now, some of you may have folks in your families who were affected by rheumatic fever, because that's been close enough, I think, uh, and we've still had cases where, where people have had family members affected. And you know how devastating that can be for those people and how serious that is. And how many of our kids have had strep throat? I mean, I had my daughter into the doctor twice this year for strep throat. Um, and then surgical procedures were associated with high morbidity and mortality due to infection. So morbidity is di di disability, uh, okay, and, and mortality, of course, is death. And so think about all the things. Every time someone gets a joint replacement, every time someone has surgery nowadays, you have your cataracts worked on, what do they give you? They give you antibiotics before and after the procedure to prevent infection, okay? Imagine what the world would be like and what medical advances would be turned back in terms of our, our medical advancement clock if we didn't have antibiotics. It's kind of scary to think about. So what's going on today? Well, I think in some ways the miracle of antibiotics or the, the blessing of antibiotics um, has made people think, well, you know, if some is good, more is better, right? And so for a long time, we've kind of been on this mentality where we just almost use antibiotics willy-nilly, and we haven't really thought about the effect that that can have. We haven't really thought about what the consequence of that might be. And so how are we doing that? Well, we might be using them for the wrong type of infection. We might be using them for too broad of coverage. We might be using some of those broad antibiotics when we could pick a narrow one. Um, we might be using it for two weeks instead of a week or even three days for some infections. And we probably are using them too often. Um, and this is just in healthcare. This doesn't even touch on what's going on in agriculture and other industries. Um, and what happens is that when we use antibiotics that way, when we make that choice as a society to use them that way, then we breed resistance. And I want to try to give you now an idea of how that happens. So <clears throat> I want you to imagine a village of bacteria. If you're having a hard time imagining a village of bacteria, just think of a village of humans, okay? Now the green bacterial guys here are the ones that are sensitive to an antibiotic, and these ones are different types of, or I guess I'd say different flavors of the same bug that are, resist, are resistant to an antibiotic. Okay, now if we introduce an antibiotic into that population, into that village, what happens? Well, again, making my plug for my marker from the, for the CDC, these bacteria are all dead. Okay. Now these bacteria survive. You'll notice that all the green ones didn't die. You're never going to kill off all the bacteria in a population. There's going to be some that survive. Um, but you see that all of a sudden we have a different makeup in terms of the types of bacteria that are left in that population and the proportions of bacteria that are left in that population. So we've gone from this, and now if we let these bacteria grow and divide and multiply, the population may look something more like this. Okay, so why is that important? Well, we've, we've all of a sudden had a shift in the population. We've all of a sudden taken a population of bacteria, and instead of having them mostly be sensitive to the antibiotic, now we have more of the resistant bugs because they've had a chance to grow. And it's really important to realize that, that bacteria are actually competing against each other for resources, okay? Most of the antibiotics that we have come from bacteria and other microorganisms. They use it to help them compete against each other for resources. Um, so, for example, mold. Um, uh, you know, it, it, again, my understanding of, of, of where penicillins come from was from mold. And, and that mold essentially uses penicillin to knock out other bacteria around it so that it can have less competition for the resources in the environment where it's living. And that's the case for many of the antibiotics um, that we have, is that they come from microorganisms. And so you can imagine that when you're changing the population, when you're changing the balance of microorganisms, that can lead to some serious problems in addition to increasing drug resistance. So the antibiotics kill bacteria that are sensitive to those antibiotics. The resistant bacteria survive and make more of themselves. And that changes your bacterial village making resistant bacteria more common than before. And you can imagine that if we make resistant bacteria more common than before, they're also going to be more likely the next time you have an infection to be the ones causing the infection. So this is going to shock some of you that are germaphobes. 
So you may, you may want to brace yourself and just take some deep breaths so that we don't lose any, any salad over this next slide. Okay? Where's the village? All right? I've talked in general about your bacterial village. Where does the village live? On your skin? In your gut? Yeah. So this is really important for everyone to understand. You are all more bacteria than you are human. And I don't say that to degrade you, but they estimate that you have about 39 trillion bacteria and about 30 trillion human cells. So you have more, and most of your cells are red blood cells, by the way. You have more bacteria in you than you have human cells in you. And it's only when you think about that that you start to say, well, how are all those bacteria affecting my health? Right? They're obviously not making me sick. Maybe they're helping me. Maybe they help digest my food. Maybe they affect diseases and the diseases that I, that I might be sensitive to. Maybe they play a really important role in my body, just like my heart and my lungs and my organs. Maybe these bacteria are important. Uh, and we call that the bacterial microbiome. Okay, it's kind of like the genome for your genes, but it's your microbiome for the types of bacteria that populate your skin and your gut. Okay, so bacteria are part of what make you healthy. They probably help digest your food. They keep your skin and your gut healthy. And they prevent bad bacteria from occupying those spots in your body and from causing disease. So it's like the parking spot's already taken by these good bugs. And as long as you have those good bugs in the parking spot, you're not going to get those rowdy teenagers coming and parking in your parking lot. Okay? So this is an active area of research into the, the human <coughs> microbiome. Um, they think that these bacteria play a role in health above and beyond just kind of holding a space. They think that these may affect your risk for diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and some people even think that there's a, a link to autoimmune diseases. Now, I can't say that's fact, I'd say that's a theory. But I think it's a theory that needs to be investigated, right? Um, and the trouble is that when you kill off your good bacteria and that parking space isn't occupied, then you can run into some serious problems. So let's talk about what happens and some specific infections that can happen when you kill off your good bacteria by taking antibiotics. So I want you to imagine that this is your skin, and I know your skin doesn't really have slots, but just play with me for a minute here, okay? So these are your slots, and you have a finite number of spaces where bacteria can be on your body or in your gut. There are only so many resources to go around. Anyone who doesn't understand this concept, just think of the summertime when we, we if, you're, if you're thinking about competing for resources, think about going to Walmart in the summertime in Cody, okay? <laughs> what happens at Walmart in the summertime in Cody? You go, to, you go there and they're out of bell peppers, right? Or bacon or whatever it is that the tourists took because we had more competition for resources, okay? It's the same thing. All right, but here we're talking about bacteria. So we've got these spots, we only have so many resources, and the bacteria are filling slots. The green bacteria are good bacteria, the red bacteria, bacterium, is, is bad. Now, there, you're always gonna have some bad, bad bacteria in your body, okay? It's not all gonna be just good guys that are, that are helping out, but they're not gonna be able to take over, right? Because you got the good guys holding them in check, all right? But what happens when you take antibiotics? What happens to these? Yeah. Oh no! We killed, we killed the good bacteria. And what happens then? Well, now all of a sudden we have some parking spots empty. And what if those spots get filled with bad bacteria this time rather than good bacteria, bacteria that can cause infection? And you all might be thinking, well that's pretty theoretical. I don't know about this. That seems pretty dubious to me. Well, let's talk about a specific infection. So you'll notice on top, of these urgent threats from the CDC is Clostridium difficile infection. Now I want to talk a little bit specifically about this because I see it all the time, constantly in the hospital. So Clostridium difficile is a bug. It's a bacteria. It lives in your gut. It's hard to kill because it forms spores that are resistant to killing. Um, so if you're cleaning your bathroom, you've got to use bleach to kill it. It's not going to respond to a lot of other disinfectants. Um, and, so it, and it's easily transmitted. Okay, um, and usually, as long as you haven't taken antibiotics, you don't get it. But let's say you have a sinus infection, or let's say you got a little bronchitis, or let's say you got a urinary infection. Let's say you course, take a course of antibiotics. 
This process that we just talked about is what can happen. Now, not all the time, but it does happen, and it happens frequently. To give you an idea of how frequently, this is from that president's report, and they went through those top 18 superbugs, and they talked about how often the infections happen, and they talked about um, how many deaths the bug causes a year. So, Clostridium difficile, again, it can cause diarrhea. Uh, it's a gut bug. It can take over if the good bugs are killed. And basically, they estimate that there are a quarter of a million infections in the U.S. a year, and that it actually kills 14,000 people a year. And you're like, I mean, where, where's our point of reference? Well, let's talk about MRSA, right? That's a good comparison. We hear all the time about MRSA. Okay, so MRSA, that's usually a skin bug. It can get into the bloodstream. It can infect your heart valves and your, your back and other places. It only causes about 80,000 infections. Now, it's much more virulent when you get it in that it's going to kill a lot more people per number of infections. But you can see that C. diff is still killing more people than MRSA infections. I think that gives you an idea, since this is an infection that almost always happens only in people that have been taking antibiotics for other reasons, how serious our problem with antibiotic use is in this country. So let's move on. So how is C. diff treated? Ironically, most of the time we treat C. diff with antibiotics because most of the antibiotics that we use day to day don't treat C. diff, but we can use antibiotics that treat mostly C. diff and not other bugs that are good bugs, and we can, we can sometimes get people to respond that way. So we use oral vancomycin a lot of the time to treat C. diff. We used to use metronidazole to treat C. diff infection. Um, but that's almost kind of just you know, fixing a problem caused by antibiotics with more antibiotics. And interestingly, when we're talking about populations of good and bad bacteria, one of the ways that they've come up to, to treat a C. diff infection is something called a fecal microbiota transplant. I, I like to call it a transpusion. Um, <laughs> it's a much more fun name, isn't it? Yeah. See, the CDC has no fun. <laughs> and what is that exactly? Well, you can see over here, you get an idea of uh, what it might be. So basically what they do is usually they take a close relative uh, they get a, f a feces sample. They, of course, check for infections that are spread through the stool, like hepatitis. Make sure they're not going to you know, pass disease between people. You basically take a blender, and honestly, I was in an infectious disease doctor's office, and they just have like your Oster blender from Walmart. It's not anything fancy. This is not a medical blender, and nor would you want to spend the money on a really nice blender for something like this. <laughs> You're not going to use a Vitamix on this. They, s they strain it. They put it into the gut, and they can do that a few different ways. The most effective way is for them to do a scope, to do a colonoscopy, and then they spray this stuff into the gut. Um, but they also will put down a feeding tube down past your stomach and down where the acid isn't nearly as much. That's almost as effective. And then um, uh, they've started to make capsules, actually. Now, then you don't get your wife's or your husband's stool. Then you've got to have a stranger's stool. But they use this, this, you know, this uh, stool that's prepared in a capsule. And it, and it is effective as well though not quite as much. But basically, what are you doing when you, when you uh, administer this stool? You're, you're giving back bugs. You're giving back the good bugs. You're sending in the posse to chase the bad guys out of town, right? And so it's kind of this cool thing where you're essentially treating an infection without using antibiotics by just changing back that population to what it should have been natively or, or close to it. Now, there are people that claim that, you know, again, when we think about that our, our bacteria might be contributing to obesity and heart, heart disease and these other diseases, what if, what if I don't want someone else's bacteria in my gut? You know, maybe I don't want to get, you know, fat or have heart disease because I've got, you know, my spouse's bacteria in my gut. And that's something they're researching. They're saying, well, what are the risks? Do we see people that get these transplants? Of, of this uh, fecal uh, bacteria, and then they have changes in their health, and, and so they're still looking at that. But it's kind of an interesting concept that you could get this fecal transplant from someone and maybe be more at risk or less at risk for certain diseases because of that. And again, it's a very high cure rate, so we're talking between 80 and 90 percent depending on how it's administered. So what can we do to prevent superbugs? So I'm going to wrap up here, and then we'll, we'll have plenty of time to talk and have a discussion and have questions. Well, I think that it's really important, first of all, you know, on the one hand, we saw that antibiotics completely changed healthcare. And on the other side of that, 
we see that if we overuse antibiotics or use them at all, even appropriately, I mean, even appropriate antibiotic use is going to change the population of bugs, right? It's going to select uh, uh, and help uh, the, the resistant bugs have an advantage. So, but as long as we use the tool judiciously, it's the balance of what it's going to do in terms of health is probably going to outweigh what it does in terms of harm. So, what I don't want anyone to do is leave this, this meeting and say, I'm never taking antibiotics again. <laughs> I don't care if I die. <laughs> you know? Because I think that would be the wrong message to take away from this. I, I think that's not the message I'm trying to get across. What I'm trying to say is, it's like anything else, it's a two-edged sword. There's good things about antibiotics, but there's sure bad things about antibiotics. And there may be some things that we don't even understand yet in terms of how they impact our health. But make sure that you take it for the right type of infection. If you have a cold, which is caused by a virus, please don't go to your doctor and ask for antibiotics. Okay? We all know it's a runny nose, it's a sore throat, you feel crappy, you're tired, and really you just want to feel better. Um, and there are great medicines out there that if you use them appropriately will help you with your symptoms and help you feel better. Uh, and the antibiotics aren't going to kill the virus anyway. The antibiotics target the organs inside the bacteria and viruses don't have those organs. So if it's a viral infection, bacteria, you know, not a bacterial infection, it's not going to help. Okay. Now, am I saying if you get a cold and you suffer through it for a couple weeks and then you start having fevers and feeling really sick that you shouldn't go to the doctor? No, that's not what I'm saying because you can get secondary bacterial infections even if you've got a viral infection first. What I'm saying is the second day of your cold when you've got a runny nose and a sore throat, Maybe that's not the time to go to your doctor and say, hey doc, give me a Z-pack, okay? <laughs> you wanna take the right duration of antibiotics. So take it as prescribed. If you're prescribed a seven day course, take the full seven day course. Don't stop after three days, okay? But also, if you have a disease like a urinary infection that can be treated often with just three days of antibiotics, maybe you don't need seven, maybe you don't need 10. Um, if you've got a pneumonia that can be treated with seven days of antibiotics, maybe you don't need 14. So maybe you take the shortest safe duration and you can work with your doctor knowing what the shortest safe duration is and I'll work with them too, that's my job. And, what's, and take the right drug. So we don't want to use broad antibiotics for everything. If you can take a narrow antibiotic, if you can get away with penicillin, take penicillin. It's narrow. Don't, don't take a carbapenem for, for your basic infection. And don't let your doctor use broad antibiotics on you if you don't need a broad antibiotic. Now, if you're in septic shock, <coughs> we'll use broad antibiotics. And then last, remember, these are just bugs. We all know what prevents infections. We know there are some good practices that help keep you safe. Wash your hands. Use soap and water. How many people do you see walk out of the restroom and they didn't wash their hands? Shame on you. <laughs> We've got to wash our hands. Use soap and water. Be careful with food prep, OK? being careful with food and how you prepare it, you know, handling chicken, handling eggs, things like that. You can't forget those rules. There, there are still infections that are passed through food. Um, get your vaccinations. And you may ask yourself, well, how is being vaccinated gonna prevent me from getting antibiotics? Well, if you get your pneumonia vaccine or 60,000 people get their pneumonia vaccine, you're gonna decrease the risk of getting a pneumonia in that population. If you get your flu shot and you don't have as bad of a case of the flu, or maybe you don't get the flu at all, maybe you won't get a secondary pneumonia from having the flu. So get your vaccinations. Decrease your risk of getting an infection in the first place that could lead to a bacterial infection. So in summary, antibiotics were discovered in 1928. They revolutionized medicine. They changed the way uh, healthcare is provided. They changed the things we were capable of doing. They saved millions of lives. But Antibiotics have their risks in addition to their benefits. Um, we don't even know all the things that changing your gut flora, your gut, your gut microbes can do to your health yet. Recognizing that there are risks helps us say that there may be times we take antibiotics that we shouldn't and maybe we can decrease their use. And remember that even when you take antibiotics appropriately, even when you need antibiotics for pneumonia, it's still gonna change the, the population of bacteria in your gut and on your skin and it's still gonna uh, affect uh, uh, the risk for resistant bacteria that's kind of in the general population. And then uh, here are my references, if any of you are interested, uh, you can go and, and find these same articles that I, I referenced, the presidential reports on there, um, and uh, some other things. Thank you.
Reaver for saving that last part till after hopefully most of us were done eating. <laughs> I didn't realize they did that. Um, but before you get up and leave today, we do want to make sure um, that you do a couple things. Um, there is a survey on, on your desk in front of you. So as we start answering questions, hopefully you have lots of questions for Dr. Weaver. Um, I just ask that you fill that out before you leave, and then we'll do our drawing here at the end. Um, but we are filming this event today, and so I want to make sure that the questions are heard. So if um, Dr. Weaver can just repeat your question that you have, I'll try and get to you. If not, speak loud. Um, but if you can, speak into the mic, and then he will repeat your question and answer that. So who has a question? Okay, I think we're going to let him go first there, and then, and then maybe we can come to you next. I have a question about probiotics. Yeah. Is that something that a person should take while you're taking antibiotics? And secondly, uh, should you take a probiotic routinely, even if you're not on antibiotics? Okay. This is a really good question. I didn't talk about probiotics in my slides. The reason I left it out is because the evidence is spotty in terms of the studies. But let me let me try to answer your question. So, the question. Excuse me. The question was: Should I take probiotics when I'm on antibiotics? And should I take a probiotic um, for good health? So let's talk about some of the risks and benefits of probiotics. What are probiotics? Probiotics are strains of bacteria that in general, we consider to be good bacteria and healthy bacteria for the gut, okay? Now, is there research out there to help us understand the benefit of probiotics or the risks of probiotics? Yes, there is. So the benefit of a probiotic is that we, there is some evidence. Now, some of it may be biased because some of it's may, the, the biggest study, um, it was done by the manufacturer of a probiotic. And anytime I see a study done by a drug company that sells a drug, I'm always a little skeptical, okay? Now, there was a Cochrane review that looked at multiple different studies. That was the biggest study in it, and it carried the most weight in that study. The Cochrane review uh, concluded that there was modest benefit to taking a probiotic when you're on antibiotics to reduce your risk of getting clustered in difficile infection and having antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So I do prescribe probiotics to my patients that are on antibiotics. Now, if you're immune suppressed, okay, if you're immune suppressed, if you're on chemotherapy, if you are on some sort of immunosuppressive drug, this could include biologic medicines for rheumatoid arthritis, um, for MS, um, you probably should not take a probiotic. And the reason I say that is just because a bacterium is supposed to be good for your, your gut health, does not mean it cannot cause infection, okay? And there are case reports out there that I saw last night when I was looking this up in the Annals of Internal Medicine, where there's a doctor that mentions treating five or six different patients who are immune compromised that ended up with bloodstream infections with these bugs. And there are also some questions about whether introducing these bugs, even though we consider them good bugs, whether these bugs can facilitate transmitting antibiotic resistance between strains of other bugs. So I think this is an ongoing area of research. I think this is something people are looking at it. In general, I support in my patients and then prescribe probiotics while you're on antibiotic to reduce C. diff infection, but recognize that you shouldn't take these uh, if you're immune suppressed. Um, and, and I'm not sure day to day they make much difference in terms of your gut health. Um, you know, uh, uh, but, but you know, are, are they gonna hurt you? Probably if you're, if you're not immune suppressed, they're at least not gonna hurt you. Uh, they may help you if you're on an antibiotic. Okay, did that answer your question? Yes, Great, thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Antibacterial soaps, if you're good for you, then you don't know or overusing them, what do you have to say on that? Again, I, I think that this is a really, important thing, so these concepts I've taught you about how, ba how antibiotics change bacterial populations, this doesn't apply just to your gut and your skin, right? This, this, this applies to all areas where antibiotics are used. So think about, this is where we're, I'll, I'll segue here. Think about agriculture, okay? If we're in feedlots giving cows, healthy cows that aren't sick, antibiotics to increase their growth weight. What does that do to the bacterial population in those cows? What does that do to the types of bacteria that humans might be exposed to? And same thing with antibiotic soaps. If you're using an antibiotic soap to wash your hands constantly, um, is, that gonna, is that gonna change the bugs on your skin and, and, and the risk of, of antibiotic resistant bugs? 
I guess what I'd say is, is I, I, lean, I, I lean against antibiotic soaps in terms of my own viewpoint, um, because I don't think they're necessary. Washing your hands with regular soap and water is extremely effective. You don't need antibiotic uh, impregnated soaps uh, to, to help with that. And, and we don't routinely use antibiotic impregnated soaps in the healthcare setting. Yeah. Do you, um, if you have a bacterial infection, do you always have to take antibiotics? If you have a bacterial infection, do you always have to take antibiotics? Um, this is a really good question. So there was actually an article that came out recently um, and it looked at diverticulitis. So for those of you who don't know, diverticulitis is an infection in your colon, okay? Um, we think of diverticuli being pouches off the side of the colon, weak spots where the blood vessels come through the bowel wall. Um, and I think the thought is that these, these little areas or these little pockets can get infected and cause inflammation of the colon in that region. There was a study actually recently that looked at treating that with antibiotics versus not treating it with antibiotics. And that study, at least, showed that in uncomplicated, meaning that there was no perforation, there was no abscess, there, there was no you know, movement of that infection into the abdominal cavity, that the outcomes were fairly equivalent between not using antibiotics and using antibiotics. So are there times uh, that people's immune systems are gonna be enough to get them through uh, a bacterial infection without using antibiotics? Yeah, I mean, if you think back in that slide I shared before um, antibiotics were even invented, some people survived infections and their immune system did the fighting. Um, but would I ever encourage someone to say, listen, if you're feeling miserable and you're having fevers and you're feeling really sick that you shouldn't go to the doctor and take an antibiotic, you know, again, I have patients that come in, um, and I can think of, of patients within the last year that I've treated, they come in the door and they look like that guy in that case I shared and they are in, in dire straits. And the longer you wait um, uh, when you have a serious bacterial infection to be seen and be treated, the more likely you end up in septic shock, the more likely you have a serious infection. So really it's a personal choice. Can you beat infections without antibiotics? Yes, you can, some of them. Can you end up in a life-threatening uh, situation if you don't get antibiotics for a bacterial infection? You can. How do you know which person you are? The person that's going to be just fine or the person that's going to end up in a life-threatening situation? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so I, what I'd say is when you're thinking about whether or not to go to your doctor and to get an antibiotic for an illness, ask yourself this. Say, how sick do I feel? Do, do, I, do I feel like I got a cold? Uh, do I feel like this is the kind of thing in my, my past that I'm gonna be better in, in a week or maybe two weeks and I've just got the sniffles and I'm a little bit tired? Or do I feel really sick? Am I having fevers? Am I having muscle aches all over? Um, you know, those are some of the things that you have to kind of rely on your own experience with illness and you have to trust your gut. If your gut says, I need to go be seen by a doctor, don't stay at home and, and, and die from an infection. Um, at the same time, if you just got a cold, um, I think that we could all say, well, gosh, you know, too often people get a sinus infection and it's probably a virus causing inflammation in their sinuses and probably too often the research shows that this is not a bacterial phenomenon and if you take some decongestants and use nasal rinses and give it some time, you're going to be fairly comfortable and you're not going to have to have an antibiotic. I, I, I don't know, I, I guess I'm maybe skirting what you're really asking me and I'm saying, yes, there are infections you can overcome without antibiotics. Um, but if you're really sick, please, you know, don't hesitate going to the doctor and, and get even sicker. Yeah. What do you think about using essential oils? Like oregano is a really good, um, kills bacteria. Yeah. So essential oils, you know, I, I'm one of these guys that I really like research-based medicine. Okay. <laughs> Like, I think the really good doctors are the ones who you ask a question and they go back to a study. They say, oh yeah, well Johnson and Howerson published this in the New England Journal and it said this. Why is that? Well, the reason that I really like research-based medicine, it's not perfect, it can't answer every question, but it helps to weed out our own biases, it helps to weed out our own ideas, when you do things in studies like randomizing and having blinds and stuff like that, it, it basically takes out the human factor and it gives you good comparisons. And so 
I just haven't, I haven't seen a lot of research on essential oils. I know people like them. I mean, I know Ashley was just mentioning before the presentation that she likes them. And, and I think people, um, I hear from a lot of people that they feel like they help, but um, can I, like as a physician, say that I, I believe in essential oils in terms of like the theory behind them or, or like that research supports their use or that there have been big studies studying oregano or other essential oils. I'm not aware of that research. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, uh, but it's just not something that, that I've seen a lot of strong research-based evidence. Um, now, is there a placebo effect for almost anything? Um, yeah, treatments can have a very strong placebo effect. Um, do I prescribe placebo medicines for my patients? I wish I could ethically. Uh, because placebo has been shown to help with cancer treatment and all kinds of things in these studies. You, you take a group of people and they think they're getting a treatment and they get better. And I, I can't explain it. Um, could essential oils have some placebo effect? I don't know. Um, could they work really well? I don't know. Um, could they be snake oil? I don't know. Um, uh, I hear from people anecdotally that they really help. Um, and, and, and what I tell people, my counsel to people is, if there's a treatment out there that isn't going to hurt you, and I've never heard of a case of essential oils hurting someone unless they were trying to treat their cancer with it, um, uh, is that if it's not gonna hurt you, I'm open to complementary and alternative treatments. And I think that that's a good place to be, which is saying we're gonna embrace diversity in terms of healthcare and treatments, um, and as long as they're not dangerous, as long as they don't hurt you, then, then, then I'm okay with them. And, and that's the advice I give my patients is, if you wanna use essential oils, go for it. Give it a try. If it helps you feel better, good. If you, if you spend money on it and it doesn't help you, stop using it. Don't waste your money. And I do the same thing for vitamins and other, other complementary and alternative treatments. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Well, I, I guess my question is, because I grew up in a family that did not take, um, I didn't get my vaccinations until I was in second grade. Yeah. And my mom was very natural. She breastfed and stuff like that. We weren't sick. And yeah. um, so in second grade, of course, we had to get, um, I'm 63, so then that'll tell you what year they did all that. Yeah. But um, I am not in favor of doing the flu shots or putting anything that's not natural in my body. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's why I do use essential oils and they do work. And I do have a rare leukemia that the hillocrystin is working. So, yeah. and it's not snake oil. So that's yeah. what. I mean, uh, look, I, I, I'm gonna just make my plug here about the term natural, okay? And, and we could have a very long winded yeah. discussion about this. <clears throat> there is nothing that is natural, okay? Nightshade is as natural as essential oils, and nightshade will kill you. There, there are chemicals in our environments, okay? And this idea that wheatgrass or something that grows as a plant is healthy for you and something made by a pharmaceutical company is not healthy for you is completely bogus. And the reason is we, we assume that because something occurs naturally in our, in our ecosystem, that, they're, that it's healthy. And that's how kind of the green, and I, I trained in Portland, so I mean, this is not new territory for me. <laughs> and that, that's kind of how there, a certain group in our population views health, is that if, it's, if it grows on its own, and, it, and if it's unrefined, then it's good for you, and if it comes from a pharmaceutical company, then it's bad for you. And I, I just scrapped that because at the basis of those ideas, it's like religion. You can't argue re religion with people. And this, this is an ideology much like religion for some people. And, and, but the, the, when you get down into the science of it, whether it's a plant, whether it's a pharmaceutical, it is a chemical, okay? It is a chemical. And it can have positive or negative effects on your body. And, and, and it, so whether it's natural or not doesn't mean much to me. I wanna know what the research is for anything showing how it affects your body. Because what I've learned prescribing drugs is that there may be benefits, but there are also harms. And the same medicine does not work the same between two people. Different people react differently to medicines. And so I think you have to have a kind of a pragmatic view of it and say, okay, I'm not gonna buy into the whole idea that something natural is good for me and something from a pharmaceutical company is bad for me because the bottom line is maybe they're both bad for you. <laughs> maybe they're both good for you. It depends on what it is and how your body is gonna react to it. Yeah. Uh, 
back to research. I was wondering if you had or read any research about the uh, any amp or any bacteria that have been grown out of agricultural use of antibiotics, most of, mostly sub therapeutically because that's the way we use them in agriculture right. today. And I was wondering if you had any any bacterium that uh, that, that we've discovered coming out of that heavy use of uh, antibiotics for our food source. So I, I won't pretend to be a, a vet uh, or um, an ecologist. And, and, and certainly, um, uh, I think there are probably some people in this room that have more background in that area than I do. Um, uh, what, what I'll say is I think the general principles still apply, um, which is that even any time you put an antibiotic into an environment, it's going to select for those bacteria that, that are resistant for it and help them propagate and increase the frequency of resistant bacteria in a population. So I, I think that people that raise concerns about antibiotics in agriculture, those same concerns were echoed in that, pre that report to the president you know, in 2014. They echoed those. They said, hey, hold on a second. We're using antibiotics in healthy livestock. Why are we doing that? That's crazy given what we know about the effect that these things can have on a, a population of bacteria. And I think science-wise, that theory sounds right to me. Um, but do I, do I have specific examples about um, bugs growing out in agriculture? That's just outside my area of expertise. Okay, then I guess, could I ask you where you could find that research? I mean, if vets aren't paying attention to who it is. You know, I, I, I think you could probably find um, microbiologists at universities that study this kind of stuff. They were prob they're probably in colleges of agriculture. Um, and I think that's probably your best your best bet. Now, I talked with an interesting guy on the phone. He he'd seen. A, he's a friend. He's a friend of yours. Yeah, yeah. We had a very interesting conversation on the phone, and and he had several different books that that he recommends. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, you might talk to this gentleman because because his friend does have several different uh, books and 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 other specific scientists who are working in this area that that are publishing and thinking about this type of issue. Um, so, I, you know, uh, again, I just feel like it's outside my area, so I'd rather not, you know, uh, uh, give an opinion on it. But, but I think if, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you could talk to this gentleman. And, and uh, you know, his friend had some suggestions for me when I talked to him on the phone in terms of books and different things that I could look at. Unfortunately, I was working last week. I didn't have time to read all those books between then and now. But, but, um, but I think they'd be good to read, and I think that they'd be very informative for you if, if that's something you're interested in.